go do something just a little different. And uh, I'm going to have Joy and, and John come up. We're just going to answer some questions about some spiritual warfare questions that we have. So you can, and if you have some questions, then let us know when we tackle the ones that we have, and then we'll uh, move on from there, okay? Because uh, we could talk about this on and on and on and on because it never ends because that's we're in a war, right? Yes, correct. Okay, you don't have to agree with me. We are. <laughs> you don't have to say anything, Rick. We're in a war, okay? We're in a war. I'm just saying. All right. So we're just going to start out and answer some questions. We don't know how this is going to go because we haven't done this before, but praise the Lord. We did this before one time, huh? Different subject, yeah, with something else, yeah. And I got this little bitty table, so it's okay, though. It's decorative. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's open up in a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, just, we just thank you, Abba, for being here with us always, for we're here for you and for you alone. All that we live, our lives, our being, our very breath, is to bring you glory in all that we do, say, think, and all that we are. Be glorified this day. We just bind every hindering spirit and any spirit that tries to disrupt what goes on here today, just asking for a free flow of Holy Spirit that you would have your way. Questions will be answered. Hearts will be touched. Your will be done. Blessed be your holy name. And you, most of all, are glorified in all of this and all that we do. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. So our foundational scripture for spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so that just is a reminder for all of us as believers that we're in a war. We're in a war and we have to fight. But we have to be trained how to fight. We have to know how to fight. And the Father so graciously teaches us how to fight. And it's all throughout his word. So you know, our prayer is that as we answer these questions, many other questions that you have had about spiritual warfare and deliverance um, will be answered. Hallelujah. So one of the questions is, how can I tell if I have demons? How do I know if I need deliverance? And so the answer to that is largely in Galatians 5, through 23. You can turn there if you have it. If not, I'm going to read it. But the fruit of the Ruach is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So simply put, one of the things that the Father told me one day when I was asking him how I can explain this to people, he said, he led me to that verse and he told me, if it's not a fruit of the, the Holy Spirit, then it's fruit of another spirit. So it's really simple. If what you're feeling, if, if, you know, in whatever you're going through, if you're not feeling fruits of the Spirit, it's fruit of another spirit that could be either oppressing you or more than that, depending on what your situation is. So again... Can I ask you a quick question as you, you explain in that? Yes. So you're saying to me that there's no mixture, there's either one or the other? No, sometimes people can, you know, start off in a certain way and then end up in a different way. I mean, the, the example of that that comes to me is, you know, the disciples when, when Yeshua was talking to them and they were walking and they said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? And he said, you don't know what spirit you are of. So just a few minutes before that, they were fine, <laughs> but then suddenly they were influenced. So it really depends on, you know, what the situation is, what you have going on. Um, and you just take it from there. That's a good basis right there. If what you're sensing and feeling isn't that, and largely also if it's to the point where you're praying and you just can't seem to shake that feeling, like for example, depression, you know, sure there are natural components to that, but if you've prayed and you've done everything you could naturally and you've said these prayers and you're still feeling depressed, still feeling depressed, that could be a spirit of heaviness, which is found in the word as well. So, uh, 
again, you know, you would need to pray and you would need to ask the father, okay, is this, is this just something that, you know, is this fiery darts, is this something outside or is this inside that I need to cast out? So how can I tell if I have demons? How do I know if I need deliverance? Oh, that's a great example. And we're going to have a lot of scripture uh, because we want you guys to really just dig into the word. And it's, it's funny because I use this example a lot. Um, you don't really notice a specific type of vehicle on the road um, unless you have it. You know, so if you have a, you know, I had a 2002 Ford Explorer one time and um, I never really noticed them before. But then when I had it, I saw them all over the place. And I was like, so many people have this vehicle. So likewise, once the father opens your eyes to the scripture, once he opens your eyes to deliverance and spiritual warfare, the, the entire word from Genesis to Revelation is loaded with spiritual warfare and scripture. Uh, in scripture it's, it's all over the place spiritual warfare and deliverance um so what are some examples of deliverance in the bible there's a lot of examples uh matthew 12 22 matthew 12 22 then a demon plagued man who was blind and mute was brought to yeshua and he healed him so that he spoke and saw uh, luke 8 27 through 31 and then 35 and 36, a demon-plagued man from the town met Yeshua as he was coming out onto the land. The man hadn't worn any clothing for a long time and was living not in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Yeshua, he cried out and fell down before Yeshua and with a loud voice said, What's between you and me? Yeshua ben, Elo ben Elion, I'm begging you, do not tor me, torment me. For Yeshua commanded the defiling spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, so that even though he was restrained and bound with chains and shackles, he would break the chains and be driven by the demons into the desert. And uh, I'm not going to read the rest of that, but it's, it's loaded with examples. Um, when you think about how many times Yeshua cast out demons and healed people, um, he was casting out spirits of infirmity, um, deaf and dumb spirits. It's, it's all over the, the, uh, the, New, the New Testament. And if you think about it, um, a good assignment would be to go through the New Testament. And everywhere you see every instance of Yeshua casting out a demon or something spiritual warfare related, mark that down, you know, write it down. And you'll see just how much it's in there. Let's see. There's so many scriptures here. <laughs> you want to read that one? Mark 1, 23 through 27, just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have we to do with you, Yeshua of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And if I could say something about that, um, a lot of times when we read this scripture, there's other translations that say, instead of saying, what, what have we to do with you, they'll say, what do we have in common with you? And that's a clue right there. Um, when you have something in common with these spirits, it'll be no, it'll be not noteworthy. For example, you know, um, the man that, you know, that he was unclothed. You know, that's a great example of a person that has those spirits that are there. They will like to be unclothed. You know, and you can see sometimes when you see um, a person that's disturbed, one of the things they will do is remove their clothing. So that is a great example of those same type of spirits that were there with the demoniac when he was not wearing any clothes. It's a great example. You know, you see a lot of people that that's how they dress in a regular basis, unclothed, in an unclothed state. And that just is showing you the type of spirits that are there. Amen. So more examples of deliverance in the Bible. Um, let's see. Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 18 says, When they came to the crowd, a man came to Yeshua, falling on his knees before him, saying, Master, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and suffers badly, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. And answering, Yeshua said, O faithless and twisted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Yeshua rebuked the demon and it came out of him, and the boy was healed from that very hour. 
Hallelujah for deliverance. So it's it's all over the word. Um, just ask the Father to reveal it to you. Write down these scriptures and just study for yourself and ask the Abba to reveal to you, um, you know, just the extent of how much it's in this word. Next question, should all believers engage in spiritual warfare and deliverance? Is spiritual warfare commanded by Adonai? So we all know that Israel is a type and shadow of modern day Israel, which includes grafted in Gentiles. And you can find that in Romans 11. Jeremiah 48.10, this is one when I first saw this verse, we both saw it, we're like, wow, that's very interesting. So Jeremiah 48.10 says, Cursed is he who does the work of Adonai with slackness, and cursed is he who keeps back his sword from bloodshed. Just ponder that. Ponder that verse. 2 Corinthians 10.4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in Yahweh for pulling down strongholds, so weapons, warfare, were to engage in battle, but only if it's authorized by the Holy Spirit. David never inquired, or never um, engaged the enemy without first inquiring of the Father. He said, shall I go up? Shall I go up? And the Father would say, go, I have given them to you. And so there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. You know, you, you, know, you can't just engage in spiritual warfare without asking the Father, should I engage? And then... About how do you want me to engage? Uh, what do I need to do? It may not be a person that's your assignment. It may not be a situation that you're ready yet to deal with because there's situations all over the place where people have witchcraft going on. And if you just start praying for somebody that has a lot of witchcraft and you're not prepared to handle the retaliation or the backlash that's going to come at you be, as a result of that, you're going to have hard times. And so we can only engage in battle when Abba instructs us to, because that way you'll have the anointing, you'll have the protection, you'll have everything that you need to be successful in that battle. Hallelujah. So that was 2 Corinthians 10, 4. Mark 3, 14 through 15. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. So we see here that the pattern was set when Messiah commissioned the 12, and one of the things that he commissioned them to do was to cast out devils. And so if we call ourselves disciples, then we are to be doing the same thing that the original 12 did, and that includes deliverance. And not everybody has to do it at the same level, of course. <laughs> you know, some people are called to do different things. We all are a part of the body, right? So we're not all the same cookie cutter thing. But everyone needs to have at least the very basics down of how to cast devils out. Because let me tell you, we've been in situations where we didn't think it was going to happen. And suddenly it was happening. You never know when something can happen. I mean, I can recall off the top of my head, uh, we were at an event with a church that we were helping, helping plant. And uh, this woman came up to the pastor out in the foyer of the event center and she begged him to pray for her. She had a spirit of addiction. And uh, he looked at her, and so he started praying for her. And that devil came out of her, and then there was a young lady nearby, like literally a couple of feet away from her, and she was disabled. And it was literally like I, I saw it, and, and this was new to me. I wasn't, you know doing warfare at that time or anything like that, but it was very clear to me what happened. That spirit left that woman and went into that young girl because it was literally like one second after. This young girl dropped to the ground and just began screaming at the top of her lungs. And so a bunch of us had to go and just lay hands on her and pray for her. And as I thought about it later on and I asked the Holy Spirit, what he revealed to me was that she was a very vulnerable person that was nearby. So she was just easy pickings for that devil that went out of that woman. So it does say that they're going to seek another place to go. Right. So, um, well, and, and also if, if I may jump in there, the individual that was casting out that demon wasn't familiar with how to protect the team because that individual was a part of the team, uh, part of the congregation and, um, they weren't protected. And so that's, that's the thing. Like, 
if you're going to cast out demons first, you have to know that I was telling you to do that. Because if not, somebody can get hurt, including yourself. You know, the enemy, he seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. That is their goal. They want to take us out of this world. They want to kill us. The enemy does not want us alive. He wants to take us out. So he's going to do that any way that he can. And so we have to protect ourselves. We have to defend ourselves. We have to know how to fight. If we don't know how to fight, we're going to always be cleaning up after the devil's mess. He's going to make a mess in our lives, and we're just going to be mopping up after his mess. Instead of being on the, on the offensive, we're going to always be on the defensive. So we have to learn. We have to train. We have to fight. This is, this has been, this is commanded by Yeshua. He said, go, cast out demons, make disciples. And so we're commanded to do this. Some of, if I may interject, some of you guys were around a few years ago. I remember a young lady at the conference, and my bad. I saw it, and I went for it. I didn't inquire. I just saw it and went for it. And she was very intimate with it, and she didn't want to get rid of it. She wanted it to stay. So there was a lot of wrestling, a lot of praying, and a lot of, whole lot of stuff, but it wasn't going anywhere because it was still welcome. That was my bad. <laughs> I should have asked, but I did not. Got to be led by the Spirit at all times. If I can add to that, we had a similar situation when we first started out. Because again, deliverance and spiritual warfare, it's an unfolding revelation. And you have to have the confidence and the faith in Him. You have to understand if He's giving you a battle, He doesn't set us up for battles that we're going to fail in. If He gives you that battle, you will be successful. Just like the children of Israel, when he told them, go, I have given them into your hand, that's what he's going to do. So you have to have that faith in him. You have to lean on him and trust him and know if he's giving me this battle, I am going to be successful. And it may not go smoothly because you may not know what you're doing, but you have to have that confidence. He has me. He's not going to let me, you know, get hurt. He's not going to let these things happen to me. I just have to lean on him. And that's very, that's very key, you know, to be so dependent on the Holy Spirit. Because the second we try to do what we think is right, it's going to go left. It's going to just go bad, you know. So you, in, in spiritual warfare and deliverance, it's literally, he gives you the play-by-play. -play. You know, oftentimes when we're, when we're doing things, he'll tell us step by step by step. And we don't deviate from the steps that he gives us. Because when you deviate, then you're, you're using your own understanding you're going by your own understanding and it's not gonna it's not gonna go well and we had the same situation where a young woman you know she was uh in a home group this was in another place we were at and um she gave us a sob story you know that actually wasn't true we were believing her at the time and uh it was a fight, you know, it, at the, the moment I uh, laid hands on her and started praying, she started screeching. And we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> and there was, you know, the, the pastor was there, there was several of us there, so we all began to pray for her. And this went on a good, I would say about an far. hour or so, yeah, and quite a while. nothing was happening. And we were looking at her like, something's wrong here. <laughs> this is not supposed to happen. They're supposed to be leaving. Come to find out, uh, we gave her a break and we're like, why don't you sit down for a while, you know, and, and then those devils just started speaking through her mouth and it came out that she was from a family of witches. She said, you know, my generations were all, my family's all witches. And so she basically admitted that that's what she was. And so I looked at her and I said, okay, you're just, <laughs> they're telling on themselves, which is what they do quite often. And uh, she was letting us know, I want them here, basically, you know. Yeah. They're not going to go because I don't want them to go. So that's another thing. You know, sometimes we can get overzealous and we can want to see people free so badly. But if, if they don't want to be free and, and they don't, they're not in agreement with it, nothing is going to happen. Yeah. Because it's dependent on their will yeah. as well. You know, and witches, satanic agents, um, they're very good actors and actresses. They speak the lingo. Um, they'll even lift their hands up and worship, uh, but make no mistakes, the enemy isn't going to send a novice into a congregation because that person might get saved. He's going to send somebody that's completely sold out to him. And so they're not there to get saved. They're there to curse people. They're, they're there to cause the pastor to fall. They're there to cause witchcraft manipulative situations. And um, so, but there's a lot of arrogance, a lot of spiritual arrogance in a lot of churches where pastors will be like 
oh, they'll just get saved. I don't care if any witches are here. They'll just get saved. No, they won't. They're not there to get saved. They're there to curse you. They're there to make people fall. That's what they have to do. They have assignments from the enemy. If they don't fulfill those assignments, they get seriously punished. And if I can add to that, that same woman, um, even though she admitted this, that pastor continued to let her go to the church and did not send her out or anything, didn't try to speak to her to see what she wanted to do or anything. He just let her keep coming. And um, I can recall one day where I was sitting behind her and I just knew in my spirit that she was doing her works during the service. And so I was just sitting behind her, countering everything she was doing. I was just like, I bind your works, you know, and I was just praying against everything she was trying to release. And at one point, she literally got so frustrated that she turned around and stared straight at me because she knew what I was doing behind her and I knew what she was doing. And so I just locked eyes with her because I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not letting you do this tonight. And she was very frustrated. <laughs> We can't underestimate the enemy, but on the same token, we can't overestimate the enemy, okay? Because we are protected. However, the power that you operate in is according to the power that works in you, according to your faith, according to your level of consecration. You know, in spiritual warfare, your level of consecration will determine whether you're successful or not. Demons know whether or not you, if you know your authority. They know... If you don't know your authority, they know if you do know your authority. And um, if, if you don't know who you are in the Father, if you're not living that consecrated life, if you're not living the life that he's commanded us to live, then you're going to have hard times because the enemy will exploit those vulnerabilities in your life. Like the seven sons of Sceva. Remember that story? We cast you out in the name of what was it? <laughs> Whom Paul preaches, yeah. And, uh, and they had a bad experience. And um, so you have to know who you are. You have to know your authority. That only comes through, through consecration and, um, and completely submitting your life to the Father and only, you know, only doing what he tells you to do. That's the key. What, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Second Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Weapons, warfare, pulling down strongholds. We're, we're commanded to fight. We have to learn how to fight. Hallelujah. So the next question, how can my prayers become more effective? I'm going to read that one. James 5, 16, 17, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Key words, effective and fervent. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. So have any of you ever heard of a prayer bullet? So in spiritual warfare, general prayers aren't going to work in spiritual warfare. You have to be specific and intentional in spiritual warfare. Okay? So let me just give you an example of a prayer bullet. Uh, let's say somebody's praying for their finances. Father, please send the finances to pay these bills. I thank you that it is done in Yeshua's name. You know, general prayer. Now, here's something that's more specific and intentional. This is a prayer bullet. Right now, I break any curses of poverty and lack coming against our lives, and I command those spirits to loose our finances and provision due to us. The things that have been stolen from us, we command them to come into obedience to the word of Elohim and be restored to me now sevenfold in the mighty name of Yeshua. You see the difference? That's a prayer bullet, specific and intentional. And Abba will tell you how to pray. But just remember that um, general prayers... They're not going to work in spiritual warfare. Of course, Abba will, honor, you know, the intent of your heart, you know, he'll honor your prayer, but he's going to teach you this is how you have to pray. You have to hit the enemy directly so you can shut down his schemes. If I can say something, you know, when you don't have the experience in different things, you can liken it to like a dull sword. You know, as you begin to war, as you begin to learn, you're sharpening that weapon. 
and you're becoming more sharp in the spirit. And as you begin to sharpen that weapon, your prayers will become more and more effective because you're learning. You know, uh, when we first started, it was just us doing deliverance on ourselves. We didn't go into this wanting to even do it with anybody else or anything. It was just, we knew we needed to be set free. And we were doing it on ourselves. And then two weeks later, he sent the first person to us. And we were like, we don't know what we're doing. Yeah, what, do we do? what do we do here? <laughs> but, you know, as time has gone by, he's given us different cases. We've had a lot of very difficult cases. And I thank him for that because it's the very difficult cases that have brought us so much revelation and so much knowledge and experience so that when we're next time facing something similar, it's like, oh, okay, we have all these things in our arsenal. We know what to do about this. And so it's a, he'll teach you and he'll train you. You can sharpen your weapon. You can sharpen your sword and you can learn how to battle more effectively. So prayer bullets are very, very important. You know, find your situation in the scriptures. Find your situation and you just pray every scripture that has to, if you're just learning, that's fine. Start there. Start with the word and just pray every scripture. And you say, Father, I thank you that your word says this about that. I thank you that your word says this. And you keep going down the list of the exact thing that you're going through. And that is going to be effective. Why? Because you're praying the word. Right. So you can't go wrong with praying the word. <laughs> yeah. there are, uh, a couple years ago, we came up with the battle book. In the battle book, that's all it was, was prayers or bullets. Any gun that you fire <laughs> makes a sound, even with a silent sword, right? So the prayers are meant to be prayed out loud, right? With authority, yes? And with faith, two key elements, faith and authority. You might as well keep it to yourself if you don't believe what you're saying was coming out of your mouth as any snow, snowball's chance of doing anything. Clear? Okay, man. You know, one thing that, is, that has happened with us, you know, when you're engaging in spiritual warfare and deliverance, you're going to learn the scriptures. I mean, the book of Psalms is loaded with warfare prayers. So if you, if you want to, really learn how to pray effectively look in the book of psalms and ask abba to highlight scriptures to you that you can use to pray and it's just amazing and um yeah it's 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 loaded <laughs> how can i walk in the authority that adonai has given to me that's a good question so put away all moral filth and excess of evil and receive with humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding yourselves. But the one who looks intently into the perfect Torah, the Torah that gives freedom and continues in it, not becoming a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he shall be blessed in what he does. James 4, 7, therefore submit to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do we resist the devil? Well, it all we were talking the other day about thoughts coming into our mind. It all starts in our mind, right? And so I like to say the example of you can't stop the bird from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. So you can't stop the fiery darts from coming into your mind, but you can choose to do, you can choose what you do with those thoughts once they enter into your mind. And so let's say the enemy puts a thought into your mind right away. You just quote 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. I cast down every vain imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against knowledge of Yah, and I take captive every thought to the obedience of the Messiah. And then you can say, I have the mind of the Messiah, and I will only think on those things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, and commendable. I have on my helmet of deliverance, and I block and cancel every fiery dart of the enemy with my shield of faith. You know, so you use the scriptures. You take the scriptures that you know, and then you personalize those scriptures. And if you have to say 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, 20 times a day to get rid of those fiery darts, say it 20 times a day. It does work. Hallelujah. And if I could add this, you know, in James 4, 7, a key there is it says, therefore submit to God. If you are not submitted, if you are not walking in obedience you might as well hang your coat up because it's it's not going to work. You know, we can't walk in disobedience and walk unsubmitted to him and his perfect will for our lives and just think that everything's going to be okay. It's not. We're going to have, see, because the enemy, the way the kingdom of darkness works, it's by legalities. 
You know, it says very clearly that the adversary is up there. You know, it says it spoke about it in Job that he was he's up there. He's the accuser of the brethren. So he's basically our prosecutor, right? He's sitting there trying to come up with ways. Why? Because that's the only way he can attack us. He has to have legal rights. And one way to get rid of those legal rights is to be making sure you're walking in obedience, making sure you are consecrated, making sure you're submitted to his will. Because like James said, submit to him and resist the devil and then he'll flee. That's the formula right there. But you have to be submitted first. Uh, and then you have some questions. How do demons come in? Just talked about that last week, didn't we? Talked about portals, portals, portals. And we've been talking about it. <sighs> if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, right? And with the commandments and keeping the word of God comes a blessing, does it not? Disobedience to it comes what? The curse. Yes? yes? So, talked about the fruit and different fruit, knowing them by their fruit. Talk is cheap. Talked about James again. James, James, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. So how does it come in? From the beginning of creation, I'm going to read it to you. From the beginning of creation, God has always allowed men the opportunity to choose. You are sovereign in your choice. You can, you're sovereign in your thinking. He has not taken that away from you. The first sin the serpent began to talk to Eve. I just want to read it to you because his mythology hasn't changed. Okay? Hasn't changed. So here it was. The Lord God, Genesis chapter 3. The Lord God had made, had made, where am I at here? Okay. Now the serpent <laughs> was more crafty than any other beast in the field and <clears throat> the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, the serpent did, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. What has he done? He's engaged her in conversation. God said, don't do it. It's the law, don't do it, correct? Should not be a question, yes? So he begged her to question. And listen, this is how he came at her with human nature. It's all right here in the scripture. And if you keep, keep reading, it is all consistent throughout all of the word of God. He says now, verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For he knows, God knows, that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So it was appealing to her. Nobody sins because it's not appealing to them. And I'm speaking from experience. And it's for the same thing for every one of you listening as well. Something about it appealed to you and it was pleasurable to your own lust and to your own flesh. Is that correct? When you yield to it, you've opened up the door, window, for anything to come in and influence you. Now, this is what happened. He knows, I'm going to read it again, verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of of it your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food she in other words she said looks good to me I'm going to try it so I tried it thought I was going to die she did die <laughs> not a physical death but a what 
So there was some distance. Now, listen. It was a light to her eyes that the tree was not to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Did they both know what the father said? But they did what what? They wanted to do that was appealing to them so they could be more like him, correct? And then what happened? Because of that, there was a curse on mankind, correct? So how do they enter in? It's because we open up the portals for the demonic to enter in. In this instance, it was her what? Her hearing. And then when she heard it and the seed was planted, then she, then when she saw it, then she, hello, every time. Yes. In the temptation in the wilderness, Luke chapter four, we talked about that as well. And I'll keep bringing that up. The temptation of the Messiah. When he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, he was led into the wilderness and he was there 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. First temptation was what? Food. For him to satisfy what? His big thing was Matthew, he said, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be, right? So if you want to know how the doors open and how they come in, it's our disobedience. It's our pride. It's our own arrogance. It's our own willingness to do what we want to do and not die to selves and do what the Father wants us to do. I promise you this, that if you submit yourself to him and yield to his will and take up your and just die, he will begin to open your eyes and you will begin to see. Yes? Isaiah 26.3. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Keep our minds on who? Him, not on the circumstances. Am I correct? So back to the temptation. He not only tempted him with what his body wanted, but listen, this is what we've lost as a body. This is why this is necessary. He tempted him. He says, if you are who you say you are. He challenged his identity. And this is what we're missing as children of God. We have no identity with our father or his son. We cannot identify with him. We made every excuse not to continue to follow and to yield. It's got to stop. Or otherwise, he will just... Keep coming and devastating if you don't think it's devastated. So I don't want to be a part of an anemic, useless body anymore. And neither should you. Okay, I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that, that, that's good. Um, there my, Romans uh, 8, 7, and 9 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity, against Yah, for it is not subject to the law of Yah, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, he is not his. So that word enmity, it's a powerful word. And when James talks about, I'm sorry, Romans talks about the carnal mind, that's your flesh nature because your flesh nature is naturally evil. There's nothing good about our flesh nature. And so that flesh nature comes with thoughts and thoughts that are contrary to the word. Your flesh does not want to line up with the word. It does not want to do the will of the father. It's enmity towards the father. And that word enmity means ill will. Uh, the opposite of friendship, malevolence. It means a state of opposition. So our flesh nature in itself is opposition towards the Father. And our flesh works with demons. They're on the same team. 
You know, we are a three-part being. We're a spirit, which is being renewed. We have a mind, will, and emotions, and a phys- and a, which is our soul, and then we have a physical body, okay? And the flesh will always have that bend towards sin, which means those temptations will always come in, and you have to get rid of those temptations. Those thoughts that are coming into your mind, you have to get rid of them immediately because if you don't, you're going to bend in the direction that's contrary to the word. And what's interesting about Genesis, uh, that scripture there, when he said, did, did God truly say, don't eat it? You can't eat this fruit? He's, he's causing her to have doubt and unbelief or to question what she was told because he never said anything about touching it. Abba said, you can't eat it. And so he said, she said, he told us we can't eat it. We can't even touch it. He didn't say anything about touching. So already when, when the enemy posed that question, he was causing her to question, well, did he really say that? Did he really say it? And she started questioning. And another thing is the fallacy there is that, you know, clearly in Genesis it says that we're made in his image. So she was already like him. But he said, oh, you're going to be like, like him. So he lied to her. She didn't realize she already had everything she needed. She was already, she had everything. And yet he told her, oh, you need this, you need this other thing. And see, that's, that's one of the ways that he gets you. You know, that fleshly carnal desires, those, the lust of the eyes. You know, you mentioned eyes and ears. You know, those are two gates. You know, a lot of times whenever we're going places or, you know, you go into a place that there's like onslaught of the enemy's music, this at the third. And a lot of times we'll just say, I seal my ear gates. You know, if there's a song that you used to like before you were walking on the ancient path, you know, I reject that song right now. I renounce that, you know, because very quickly, like you use this example all the time, you know, if you, if you hear a song that you used to love when you were a young person in a store somewhere, you know, the enemy will just get your mind. And if you're not disciplining your mind, you'll go very quickly to the time when you first heard that song and you were with these people and you were doing this and you were doing that. And then what is he trying to do? He's trying to get your mind to another place, right? He's trying to get you to not have your mind stayed on him so that you won't be in perfect peace because he can send these spirits, these fiery darts and see you have that instant to reject it. You have that moment to reject it. If you don't, they're like, okay, because, you know, they can, they, they can watch you and they can be like, okay, we're going to shoot this dart. What are you going to do with this thought? And see, part of a lot of, uh, a, lot, a lot of ways that people go wrong is they say all the time, you know, I don't know if this is my thought or if this is the devil or if this is my flesh. Well, here's one way you can figure that out because there's only three, way, three places it can come from. Your flesh, him or him or them, <laughs> you know? And so you already know your flesh is enmity with him. So if, if the thought you're getting is something good, if it's something holy, if it's something that lines up with the word, it's automatically going to be Abba. But if it's something selfish, you know, selfish ambition, you know, one of those 17 works of the flesh, it's clearly your flesh. If it's something that, you know, he's trying to get you to sin, it's, so that's how you can determine, is this me, is this him, or is this them? And it, it comes with, with experience and with learning how to discipline your mind and renewing your mind. But it, it takes work to do that. You know, it's, it's work to renew your mind. It's something that you're going to keep having to do. Why? Because when you, when you made that confession, now you have to work at it and you have to make yourself, you, you have to continue on that path, you know, and you have to continue to go higher. And one of those ways is just renewing your mind and making sure that your actions and your words and everything that you're doing is lining up with the word. Yeah. That, that's powerful because when you got saved, your mind didn't get saved. You know, we have to continuously renew our mind. Romans 12 two, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Transformation is change. And the only way we can begin transformation is changing the way we think, the way we've acted, because the flesh comes with those old behaviors and reactions that when somebody says something, 
or you hear something, you automatically react a specific way because you've always catered to your flesh before you became a believer. But now we're believers. And so now we have to be mindful of the things that um, are that's going on in our minds. What are we thinking about? Ah, this is a good one. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8 says, He that digs a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Opening the doors. That's a powerful verse. Yeah, because it says that he puts a hedge of protection around you, right? It says that, that we all have a hedge of protection. And who's opening it in this verse? You're opening it yourself, just like he said, with what you're doing, what you're allowing, the things that you're, you know, experiencing, and you're just allowing these things to come in. You're, you're looking with your eyes. You're allowing the things to come into your ears that shouldn't be. You know, you're opening that hedge, and it says a snake is going to bite you. Yeah. You know, that this is a spiritual principle. I'm going to uh, open up a can of worms, and I kind of want to close with this can of worms. <laughs> Everything that uh, we have been talking about and all of these scriptures are written for believers, okay? You given your life over to Christ, over to the Messiah. You are his, and yet Paul says, and, and John started to read it, <laughs> he says, when I would do good, evil is always present because in my flesh there's no good thing. Your flesh is always, always ready to sin. Are you following me? The only good thing in your flesh is, your, is the spirit, the recreated spirit that you have. Your flesh can always fall. But the same guy that said that says, lay aside, <laughs> put on, put off, put away, which means you have the authority to bring this under subjection. Are you not being conformed to the image of? He says, if you will walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the. But you must walk in the. So can demonic and fiery darts touch and move upon a believer? Yes. <laughs> yes. Can you be at this point in your life praising the Lord and high and a month later be down here because of circumstances? If you allow it, yes, you can. Can God tempt? Does God tempt us to sin? Not according to James 1. When you're tempted, you're drawn away by your own lust. And then when it's conceived, it brings forth. Okay, so how do you know the difference between a trial and the temptation of the enemy? The Father tests you for the testing of your faith, brings forth what? Endurance, Endurance and patience. But he does not tempt you to fall and put things before your eyes that will cause you to sin. That's from the enemy. His testing is always to cause you to do what? Die. For you to be purged. For you to humble yourself before him that he can live in and through you. Do not be, and I'll give you this testimony, I'll shut up and I'm going to let them close and then pray because it's getting, I'm watching the clock there. Some of you have heard this before. I'm sitting, not sitting, I'm walking on a fence line, and I got all of my weapons with me when I used to work on the gate. And I'm walking around that fence line, and I'm just praising the Lord, and I'm just talking to Him. And I'm talking to Him out loud because I've learned to do that. That's what He, that's what he wants. He likes for you to be verbal. And faith comes by hearing all that stuff. Okay, so I'm talking to him and I'm praising him. And, and I started thinking in my mind, man, what if somebody comes around and sees me and hears me? You know, they're going to think I'm crazy. Now, that's not a temptation for me to sin, but it was a fiery dart to get me to break my fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? 
It was a distraction to get my focus off of him. And then all of a sudden, as I'm, I'm thinking these things, then he began to speak to me. And, and it's, it's like, man, I had an open vision. It was wild. And I could see the fiery darts coming at me. And the fiery darts were red, like red little darts of fire. And they were just coming like everywhere. And I was like, wow. And he had me speak. So I began to speak. And this is what I spoke. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And I yelled it just like that. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And I spread my arms out. Now listen, I got M16. I'm, 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 I'm soldiered up, okay? But I'm not using them weapons. I'm using praise. And he allowed me to see in the spirit white fiery darts coming from my body, not only quenching the darts of the enemy, but begin to drive back the source of those darts. Are, are you following me? The, high, the hottest part of the fire is not the red, it's the white part. I didn't know that at the time. Come on now. God is always hotter than the enemy. He's always more powerful. He is all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient. Hashatan is not those things. He wants to be, but he's not. His power is limited. So give him no, she said it, no place. Okay, I'm done. Sorry, I get excited about these things. <laughs> I just want to end it with this one. Um, ex sorry. Exodus 23, uh, Exodus 23, 29, and 30. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and possessed the land. And then Deuteronomy 7, 22 and 23. The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. Deliverance is progressive. You may not make an end of them at once, lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you. But Adonai, your Elohim, will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. And the last one here. J uh, Judges chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 4. Now these are the nations that Adonai left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. The Father will allow things to happen so you can learn how to fight. So you can learn how to engage in battle. If we don't have things happen to us, we'll never learn. And so ponder those scriptures and um, praise Abba. He's just, he's amazing. He's so amazing. And we can easily go for a long time. Yeah. Anybody have any questions about anything we've covered tonight? Okay. Go ahead. Father, we just thank you for tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing, the gift and the miracle of deliverance. And we thank you, Father, for, for teaching us how to engage in battle. Abba, we are all in different places in our walk with you. But Abba, I just pray for every single person watching that, Abba, that you would reveal to them spiritual warfare and deliverance, what they're to do, what they're called to become, who you've created them to be, that they will walk out their call. So reveal the scriptures to them, Father. We thank you, Father, that they will become who you have called them to be because they will make that decision to go all the way for you 100%. They will not waver. They will not go to the left. They will not go to the right. They will stay fixed and focused on you. And so, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, guys. Uh, did y'all get something out of this? Okay. Praise the Lord. All right. So we didn't waste our time, man? All right. All right. Praise God. For more teaching and information, visit us online today 
Come and be a part of our fellowship here at The Seed. Enjoy worshiping and learning God's Word with us.